Hello, art history students. Welcome to Unit 2, Lecture 4, uh, which is going to cover the Jomon culture in early Japan and then uh, Bronze Age China. And as we talk about these things, we're going to talk more about the afterlife, ancestral worship, and then we're going to talk about kind of this idea of how ancestral worship can influence the real world when we talk about terracotta warriors. So right here, I want you guys to kind of pay attention to, I put this timeline in and then this purple line that's here represents the timeline of the Jomon culture in Japan. So it is spanning most of what we've talked about thus far. We will talk about ancient Greece next. And I just want you to know that this culture is spanning all of that timeline and more. <clears throat> so the Jomon is basically the earliest people in Japan. And like I said, it kind of begins or coincides with the Neolithic period in Europe, which we would have talked about in lecture one of this unit, and then ends um, roughly around the time that the Romans are kind of coming to power. So this culture is broken down by insepid, initial, early, middle, late, and then final period. And we're going to look at the evolution of their artwork, specifically their pottery, throughout that time frame. <clears throat> so the term Jomon means cord marked or cord pattern, and it comes from the style of this pottery. So if we look here, this is an insepid piece from the Jomon culture, so the very first, the very beginning of the culture. And this piece has these kind of little holes here, and it has a rounded bottom, which means that it does not ever sit in a stable place. It actually hangs over top of like a fire or a fire area. It's a cooking pot is actually what it is. So there's a little bit of this design work that we see kind of at the top band area, and that's that cord pattern or that kind of rope pattern. So we know because the bottom of this is rounded like this, we kind of know its purpose. We can also kind of make the assumption that these people might be on the move, right? There's not time for things to sit and be stored, right? This is that Neolithic time frame in history. So let's keep going forward in time. These are more examples of those insepid bowls, right? We see a little bit more of this design and patterning. This is actually the same one that we just looked at. Right. So again, I know I talked about this in um, the when we looked at those frescoes of the Aegean culture. These are kind of re put together or, you know what I mean? Pieces may be lost or broken. So it's not that this object was found in its entirety. It was actually found broken and archaeologists have basically put it back together again. So here we have this piece from the initial period, which is kind of the next period in time for the Jomon culture. And we see that patterning has uh, developed all over the form from the top, which there was just kind of decoration at the top. It's now gone all over the form. There's still kind of this rope pattern, right? This kind of repeated repetition of pattern. There's also a flat base, which means that the culture is probably a lot more stable, staying in one place, uh, this jar or this container would not be used over top of a fire. So it's still a utilitarian object, but it's maybe not used for such a domestic purpose. I just want to note also that the inside of this bowl is lacquered with gold, and that is something that happened much later in time. So that technology did not exist at the initial time that this was created. It was reused or kind of revisited as an important object later in history during the Japanese tea ceremony. Next we move into the early period. So we see a couple things. We still see this design kind of influence at the top and then there's still this flat bottom. So just so we know this kind of fluted top here that you see is actually for stretching a probably what would be a piece of leather or like an animal skin over top of this large jar. And then it would be 
tied kind of where the jar comes down here. And this means that they're storing food for longer periods of time, um, you know, prepping for winter, those kinds of things. It's, it's an evolution of the culture. And again, this patterning is all over the piece, right? Just like we saw in the previous one. And it's also kind of developing and growing a little bit, getting a little bit more complicated. There are still a lot of the same artistic elements or the same kind of design ideas flowing through all of these pieces which are flowing through time but they're slightly getting more and more uh more and more evolved more and more decorative even though there is still this core of utility in the fact that it is a pottery piece all right as we move from the early into the middle we start to kind of move away from that clear utility, right? This piece, look at how much the uh, the patterning is changing, right? The form is actually changing. It's, it's kind of growing in this less utilitarian way. Patterning is becoming much more intricate as we move through time. This is another middle Jomon piece. And as we see that, design has kind of taken over, right? The utility is pushed away. You can't store anything in this object for a long period of time. It's not used for cooking. It's much more for a ritualistic purpose, right? It's kind of, this is called flameware pottery is what this develop in, develops into. And I think that there's kind of a connection between the earliest use of pottery, how it had that uh, rounded bottom and the cooking flames would go around it right and we're kind of moving that the beauty of the fire is now kind of what this object is about this is the late jomon culture right this is kind of the explosion of all of that intricate detail right all of the the swoops and kind of the swirls right you can <clears throat> excuse me clearly see that flame style pottery of how why it's called that right and again the container is actually very small right it's kind of the the fact that this object is containing something is certainly no longer its main purpose right it's all of this that's kind of coming out of the top of it that is really what the artists or whoever is making this is paying more attention to that and you as the viewer are seeing more of that Right? So that's really coming to the forefront of what the object is about. So there's this evolution of form, right? This evolution of decoration that is kind of coinciding with the prosperity of the culture. If we could imagine kind of like a, a graph that's kind of going like this, right? As time progresses and prosperity progresses, also decoration is progressing if you want to think about it as an x and a y axis so let's talk about kind of the last or time frame in the jomon culture so the final jomon uh kind of breakdown of this very large very long time span culture is called the final and here the culture is kind of going into a decline but so there's this return to strictly utilitarian objects but there is definitely this reference all of this design work that we see here is referencing back to that flameware style that the time of prosperity so let's kind of break that down again so I've kind of put all the images that we've seen from this culture in kind of a chronological, almost like a little wave here, right? Just like we would have talked about as this could have been a graph or a chart, right? If this is the peak here of prosperity, and then when the culture goes into decline, the art that is created directly references this peak, right? It's looking back at a better previous time and kind of replicating the artwork that it that would have been at this time of high prosperity and we see this a lot in 
art. And that's one of the reasons why I'm kind of introducing it here in this kind of early unit. Art is often going to reference what the makers or the people of the time that it was created would see as the height, right? Or the, the best. There's this time called Romanesque, right? And it's referencing back to the, the great time of Rome, right? That's what directly what artists are looking back at. There's a couple times when the prosperity of a culture and the art that's created, you know, we're kind of referencing this peak time, aren't in alignment, right? Specifically during the uh, Northern Baroque period, this Rococo period where there is this decline in prosperity for the majority of people, but there's this super tiny elite wealthy class that makes all of this artwork. So there's a disparity about this. So this is not a rule that's set hard into stone, but we will see oftentimes art referencing previous art and sort of this, the reason that it's, that it's referencing previous art usually has to do with prosperity in some way. And I use that term prosperity rather than the term economy. So you could think about it like prosperity is people having what they need, right? People having food, people having safety, people having all their basic needs fulfilled to the point that they can create art about ritual and about more for the beauty of it, right? If you are having a hard time surviving, you're not going to create something this elaborate, right? So this is gonna change, and we're also gonna talk a couple times, especially as we get farther into, I guess, the future from where we stand now in the class chronologically, it's going to be where art will often reference time back, sometimes to draw awareness to a lack of prosperity or something of that nature. I think back to um, when we looked at art and analysis and we talked about the Gorilla Girls poster of um, that previous artwork, the Grand Odalesque, right? So there was this reference for the specific group of people. In that instance, it was feminism. But there's always going to be this reference back in the art world. So that's kind of one of the main themes that I want to push forward with looking at the Jomon art, specifically their pottery. So I'm just gonna take like two seconds if we were in the classroom, which I wish we were, I would ask you guys if there were any questions about this, but at the moment we're just gonna move on to more amazing Jomon artwork. So these are the Dogu. These are, their purpose is unknown. I want to stress that because we're going to see more of these. And then as we move into the Kofun period, we're going to see more of these kind of little figurines, which may or may not actually be similar in their purpose. So the purpose of the Dogu is unknown. These are little clay statues and they are a lot of them were found um, archaeologists have found a lot of these dogos. So they know that they were very common. They were very important, the fact that they would have made so many of them. And as we go to the next slide, they made them out of a multitude of materials. They're not always made out of clay. This one is made out of stone. But they have this kind of very interesting body with these kind of interesting eyes and this kind of helmet. They're highly decorated, right? Kind of in that same, not quite the same flameware pottery, but a lot of those same kind of spiral decorations are um, apparent on both. This is the Jomon Venus figure, right? So I put that in quotations. Um, we talked about this when we talked about the um, woman of Willendorf. So the idea of these fertility figures, when this was early art historians and archaeologists and whatnot, use this term Venus, right? So Venus is the Greek goddess of love. And there was kind of this relationship that, oh, this must be the ideal woman, 
right? The, when we think of the Venus of Willendorf, it was those kind of like wide hips and large breasts, right? But our, our historians and archaeologists and just kind of academics in general are kind of moving away from that concept. So when I found this, when I sourced this image, this term Venus was associated with it. And I try not to ever change any of the information that's present when I pull images from museum websites or anything like that for these lectures. It's just kind of a an honesty thing. I never want to edit information. So I put that in quotations because it was there when I sourced the material. But just so you guys know, that's kind of a thing of the past for uh, historians and academics and art historians. So this is that uh, Jomon fertility figure is what I'm going to refer to it as. So it has some of those same things. There's this kind of interesting helmet that she is wearing, right? But she does have some of those same figure forms. Again, the purpose of these is unknown. So this may not be a fertility figure at all. The whole point of the dogus may be completely different than anything that we would see in what we could, would consider to be Neolithic Western art, right? Or the art of Neolithic Europe. Um, but again, this is kind of the best guess that they would have. This little helmet thing, I know I made this joke once before, but the uh, ancient alien people, right? If you've ever watched that show, they have a lot of theories about these, especially because they're wearing um, helmets and whatnot. So it's, it's a funny, it's a funny. All right. So as again, this is another from the late Jomon period. So they're not always uh, standing figures. Sometimes they're sitting figures. Just two things I want to point out is this patterning, right? That's that the cord patterning or kind of the rope patterning that is very synonymous with Jomon uh, culture and Jomon art, right? That's what the that word actually means is that cord pattern. And then also this little golden thing here, this little this is just a little plastic thing that this stands on. It's not part of the object. The object will actually sit on its own. I just want to make, just, just for clarity's sake. Okay, so there's some information here that is not necessarily going to be on your test or anything. I just wanted to give you this information just for full clarity. So after the decline of the Jomun culture came this Yao Yi period right and then we're not talking about any of the art from that time frame what we're going to actually talk about is the kofun period which i would say if this is sort of our prosperity chart right and this is sort of that flame wear style and then they go into decline the kofun period is kind of like the next rise right rise in prosperity thus rise in uh, art that's being made art and prosperity oftentimes go together. The more prosperity there is, the more art there is being made. So the Kofun period saw a rise in funerary rituals and what could be a new clay figurine or could potentially be a clue to what the dogu were. But these new clay figurines are called the Hanawa and we're gonna see exactly how the Hanawa were used in funerary rituals. So these are Hanawa. They are not just people. The Hanawa represent everything that's important in this life, right? Like your home and your horses and the people that are in your life as far as, um, you know, servants and whatnot like that. So the Hanawa are directly related to funerary rituals. And I want you guys to kind of just Remember for a moment all of the funerary rituals and funerary ideas that we talked about during the last lecture, which would have been on ancient Egypt. So during this Kofun period, they make these um, keyhole shaped tombs, right? So this image here is a current day, I, I, I mean, I don't want to say like 2021, but maybe 2001 or something 
of this same, this is an artist recreation of one of these grand tombs. So we see there are larger tombs and then smaller tombs, and they all have this keyhole shape and then this moat around them. So what would be on that kind of keyhole shaped mound would be these Hanawa, right? And they're placed around this tomb, right? As a representation of what this important person who's buried here would sort of have in the afterlife, right? So everything that you had in this life is re-represented as part of the afterlife for the Hanawa. That's kind of their purpose. So your home and your maybe, you know, all the people that would have guarded you, and if you had any military presence or military power, all of the soldiers that would be underneath of you would all be kind of present here. This was part of that idea, just the same as the ancient Egyptians had, where this life is not really the main goal. It's the afterlife. That's what is more important. And what you do in this life and who you are in this life has a direct relationship to the afterlife. So. All right. Again, we're not in class, but I hope that you guys can kind of see the parallel between prehistoric European art and the Jomon culture, and then the funerary importance of the afterlife for the Hanawa and ancient Egypt. So if you have any questions, please email me. I'm super happy to answer them anytime. Okay, so we're talking about Bronze Age China. So I want to just kind of put everything in a little bit of context. We're going to talk about a little bit about the Shang Dynasty, the Zhao, the Qin, and the Han. Right. This is the time frame that we're kind of talking about. And you can see where it kind of coincides with what we would have talked about when we talked about Mesopotamia and then also in Egypt. Just showing you know, this little symbol that I put here. This is roughly the time frame of Akhenaten. So just to kind of put everything in context of what's happening simultaneously around the world. So in um Another thing, just, just for clarity's sake, roughly in here in the Qin Emperor um, Empire, there's technically the distinction, according to certain sources, between Bronze Age and then the Iron Age begins. But dates like that are never super set in stone. And remember, the difference between Bronze Age and the Iron Age is, is not always the same in every place throughout the world. Technology is sometimes develop in one place and then migrate out from there and get sort of readapted or something of that nature. So we're just gonna kind of use this term Bronze Age China as an umbrella term. So the big things that we're looking at is the importance of ancestral worship and then the funerary rituals and sort of the, the burying and tombs, right? So we're playing off what we just kind of talked about with the Hanawa in uh, Japan. So there's this reverence for the ancestors, the importance of the afterlife. So your ancestors are the people who have come before you, your family members. And then in this ancestral worship belief, the ancestors become supernatural. Um, they become kind of like their representation is often dragons. And they can communicate with the greater gods they can also intervene with your life as their descendant, right? So you have to keep them happy. They can protect you. They can also sort of like punish you if you dishonor them or something like that. They're, even though they are gone, they are certainly still a very big part of your life, right? And who you are as an individual. And that's important. It's not just this pantheon of gods up there that acts and interacts kind of regardless of who you are. They have kind of a direct impact on your life. At least that's the belief structure of these people between the realm of the living and the sacred realm. All right, so we saw this artwork earlier in the class. This is a ritual container from the um, 
this is the tau te motif right so we have this kind of central line here and it's kind of like two mirror images of this kind of dragon form right these are its eyes and these are kind of its horns but it also has this it's like a multitude of faces layered on top of each other is kind of what you would see and that anything that the tau te motif is on is always going to have to do with the ancestors so just to reiterate that point this is it kind of drawn out it might be easier for you to see this this way so this is a zoomorphic motif right that's a vocabulary word that we would have learned last unit right and it has this association with the ancestors and also kind of dragons which are kind of the same thing they're different but the same right so this is used in rituals that deal with the change of the seasons and also specifically with ancestors so this is called a guang this is a ritual wine vessel so this object is basically like like a teapot kind of right it's got this handle on the one side and then wine would come out in this area and it has that tau te motif on it actually many times over it might be kind of difficult to see but this is the tau te motif here there's that kind of center line the eye and then there's the kind of horn on the one side you can see it on the other side also so we know that this object deals with the ancestors and what this wine vessel is for is actually for bringing wine to the ancestors in this belief structure of ancestral worship your involvement was very important to your ancestors you had to bring them things and if they were to maybe come to you in a dream or something you had to do what they say they're they're involved the afterlife's involvement on your life was very strong there's a very strong connection between those two so unfortunately no one sat down for sunday dinner and poured their wine for themselves out of this incredibly awesome ritual wine vessel and these came in a huge variety of shapes and sizes all right so there's again just that kind of information and here are some other examples of these ritual wine vessels again all of them have i know it might be difficult to see but you can kind of see the tau te motif is represented and repeated in a couple different places this one here with this cow is absolutely my favorite just on a personal note Look at those bulging eyes. You can't tell me that the person who created this did not have some kind of sense of humor. Um, and I often like to think that the ancestors that they were thinking of maybe also had a good sense of humor and that was why. Um, I don't know that, but I like to think that. That one's, that one's definitely my favorite. This, all of these are just awesome. And again, they're only used for bringing ritual wine to the ancestors, to feed the ancestors. All right, these are from the Zhao dynasty, which is, or Zhao dynasty, which is next kind of chronologically after the early um, Shang dynasty that we talked about just a minute ago. And these are ritual bells, and they would come in a variety of shapes, not, not a variety of shapes, a variety of sizes, I'm sorry, but they also have to do with the afterlife and we can see again that representation of the tau te motif both on the side and on the top so let's look at them these are ones from the late bronze age and the different size would make different sounds right like a like a xylophone they were hung on these um, large wooden beams in a row according to size and then would be played with kind of a, a big not a baseball bat but you know a, a ritual kind of thing that would hit them much like a xylophone think about it in that way so again only for those ritual purposes because they have that tau te motif on them all right so next we're going to talk about the first emperor of china which is qin shi huangdi right i'm just going to call him emperor qin right this is how that is spelled 
Um, so this brings us to this warring states period. During the Zhao dynasty, China was not a unified culture, right? It had a multitude of languages, it had a multitude of currencies, of belief structures. For the most part, ancestor worship was kind of the universal idea, but how ancestor worship was kind of presented or practiced, we'll say, differed wildly. Blech. Sorry, guys. So when this emperor came to power, he made it his life's mission to unify China, unify it under one rule, first of all, and then also under one currency, under one um, one language. He he's like the master of standardization. So if you can imagine that you were a trader and you were going from, you know, you lived kind of like in this little area where a multitude of places were. And when you went with your little cart of goods from one country or one sort of ruling state to another, the road wasn't wide enough for your cart to drive on. If you Can you imagine if you went between West Virginia and Maryland and suddenly your car didn't fit on the road, how difficult that would be. So that's one of the things that he standardized was the amount of space between wheels on the axis of a cart, right? Which sounds very silly, but when you really think about it in practice, that is part of what makes the flow of people and goods and whatnot between spaces, which also helps with the flow of ideas, which helps with the unification of a group into a kind of homogenous culture. So, Qinxi Wangdi is credited with a lot of things, but he did not do it passively or peacefully. This was the, it's not called the Warring States period because everybody got along really well. This was a time of a lot of conflict on a multitude of levels. So Qinxi Wangdi knew that his life would would end and that he would go into the afterlife. And he also believed that in his effort to unify China, that he had made many, many enemies. And he knew that he had to bring his army with him into the afterlife. So from the moment that he rose to power, this all happened in one man's lifetime, which is kind of incredible. From the moment that he rose to power, he began replicating his army in clay. So that way, when he got to the afterlife, he would have every, he would still have his army with him. And so this is just some of the buried terracotta army, right? So you can see the, the real true importance of the afterlife. You don't just set about doing something like this because you have a passing fancy in the afterlife. This is a true hardcore belief. So this um, mausoleum and this terracotta army was thought to be a legend, and then it was rediscovered in 1974 in China when a farmer was trying to dig a well, if you can imagine finding something like that. So this took 36 years to complete, which means that it would have been a massive manpower undertaking. So let's look at these terracotta warriors a little bit more in depth. So if you look here, there are not just the warriors in their armor. Everyone has uh, armor and whatnot. It's not just the warriors. It's also horses and carts and the guy who cooked all the meals and all his pots and pans are recreated and any kind of equipment that would be needed, ladders, anything like that this army would need was replicated in clay and then at part of this burial complex in Xi'an. So if you also look at these, this guy's face and then look at this guy's face, they're not just kind of generalized faces. They are unique features, right? Every individual person who fought for this emperor was uniquely identified. Now, let's look at that a little bit more. 
So here we see some of those unique faces and those unique characteristics. So it's probably easy to say and assume that if you were a top general, you probably had your face sculpted very clearly to your identity. Whereas if you were the army ditch digger, you probably kind of get a generalized face. So they're not, they're not like 100%, but there is a specific identity for each of the soldiers, right? It's not that he just made this terracotta army larger than his army. Because remember, what is in the this life is re-represented in the afterlife. So they had to kind of be parallel. This isn't like a make-believe army that he then would take to the afterlife, like golems or something. This is this is a real representation of people who would have existed. So they found that a lot of these terracotta warriors, which are not all buried in one place, it's sort of like a complex of um, different burial mounds with different groups of soldiers and eventually where uh, Emperor Qin would have been buried. So some of these places were sort of found and after his death, people went in and destroyed this army. Now, this isn't like a natural disaster happened and all these broke. People of the time after his death who he was not a very well-loved person, warring states period, right? He was not well received by everybody, went in and destroyed a lot of these terracotta swords because the belief was that strong, the belief that he would then command this army in the afterlife and they would eventually have to go to the afterlife and their ancestors are in the afterlife. So they did this in this world almost to the the sacred realm and the real realm are very well clearly connected in this belief structure so just kind of putting all that information forward next we're going to move to the han dynasty which is the next dynasty chronologically after the Qin dynasty and we're only going to look at one artwork but we're going to kind of break down quite a bit of iconography and kind of um, what the belief structure is still in line with the idea of the afterlife. So this is the painted banner from the tomb of Lady Di. I'm not going to try to pronounce this part of her name because I know I will mess it up. So there's a couple things we see here that we've seen in other artworks. So there's these lines going here, here, and here. And they are used very much so like registers from ancient Egypt, separating the kind of cosmic sacred realm at the top, the heavenly realm, and then underneath here, I know it's kind of difficult to see, is Lady Di and her attendants in life. This is then the morning of Lady Di after she passes, right? So there's kind of this, in this image, in this section, there's kind of this merging of sacred realm iconography with real world iconography and then the bottom is the underworld but what we're going to pay attention to is kind of this top part this widest part right this is kind of the the largest section of all four sections and there's an interesting story here so if you see there's this kind of all these orange circles and then this bird in there right so i'm we're going to do quick story time with Lacey. So it was, the story goes that there originally used to be seven suns in the sky and they would take turns each day. And then after a sun would go across the sky, it would rest in this tree. And they would repeat this kind of pattern of all these multitudes of suns moving. So what happens is one day this big crow lands in the tree where all of the suns are resting and scares them all into the sky at one time. And then this is too much. There are too many suns in the sky. The, the seas are boiling and uh, everyone's burning. It's too hot. There's seven suns in the sky at once. So a kind of mighty archer, um, goes and takes his magical arrows and he shoots the suns out of the sky. And just before he's going to shoot the final sun, 
someone comes and stops him and prevents him from casting the world into darkness, which is why we only have one son now, right? So this is the kind of story. And if you're thinking to yourself, why do we need to know this? Just know that the, that things will oftentimes maybe work their way back into the class. Um, so, but for now, just enjoy that as kind of a little story of a little myth from Bronze Age China. So Lady Dai was a noblewoman. Her tomb was excavated in the 1970s. And then this was the textile that was laid over her coffin and shows her journey to the underworld from life through death and then into the sort of sacred realm and eventually up into the heavens. It's important to note, I'm gonna move on. So here you can see some of that information broken down. It's important to note that Lady Di was so well preserved that they were able to actually do a, uh, like an autopsy on her body and she died of a heart attack or some kind of cardiovascular issue. And she would have been buried in a series of nesting coffins, kind of like those Russian dolls that all fit inside of each other. She would have been entombed in a coffin and then that would have been placed in two substantial coffin or subsequent coffins, sorry. And they all would have fit into each other. So a noble woman with a lot of power and wealth that would have went along with her life. All right, these are all of the key terms. I will see you guys next time for the, uh, for Greece. So that's what we're talking about next time. Have a good day, stay happy and healthy. Email me if you have any questions.